Well, welcome. I'm Bud Baselak. I'm the provost here at Case Western Reserve University. I hope you're enjoying the conference, uh, whether you're here in person or virtually in Second Life. It's been a, a busy time since I've arrived uh, about six months ago uh, at, at Case Western Reserve University. And, and even at, you know, in considering this position, I was well aware for many years, having been down, down in Columbus, of the, uh, the great reputation that this university has in the area of information technology, the excellent leadership that Lev and his team brings to this important area at our university. Uh, you know, this is a really a great event. It's the second year, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity for you to be here and work with us and, and share with us some of your insights around some of the newest innovations, allow us the opportunity to share with you what we're doing here, where we feel we're at the cutting edge, and also certainly allow you to share with us in terms of some of your ideas in moving this whole important area forward. This is, again, the second year, and Collab Tech continues to be a proud tradition of Case Western Reserve's forward-thinking approach. That's very much the topic of our strategic plan, if you've heard much of us talk about that. Back in 1971, I think, as many of you are, are aware, this is, this is really uh, was one of the places that began the ARPANET, and so which, of course, was the, was the precursor to the Internet. So we've been at the cutting edge really ever since then. It was also the first campus in the nation to wire its residence halls and with fiber optics back in 1989. Some of you probably remember Freenet. For those of you who do not, it was the first higher education outreach program that tried to provide the broader Cleveland community access to internet resources. So we, again, in addition to focusing much of what we do on our infrastructure, our academic programs here, uh, the IT program here at Case Western has been very much engaged in the community and working with the community to bring these resources to a broader constituency in Northeast Ohio. More recently, I think, as you know, in that regard, we've, uh, we've led the efforts to establish one community, Northeast Ohio's award-winning community networking venture. It now connects more than 1,500 education, healthcare, and public organizations in 22 counties across the region. Finally, one of the recent innovations that has proved to be popular with students is the Media Vision Courseware. It began in 2004 with fun faculty pioneer, the late Ignacio Ocasio, uh, known to everyone on campus as Doc, a Doc Ock. And in fact, some of you who were around, I think it was about two weeks ago, we has uh, been a statue of him, a uh, bronze statue near Delbert Hall, which was unveiled. It re recognizes his many contributions to the university. Five years later, more than 70 courses are currently available as a searchable learning content, including our, most of our introductory courses. Probably surprised that none of us that have the highest use of service around the campus, they're taking, they're taking exams. So many of the people who use this, of course, are busy today studying, and uh, we are in the middle of our exam week. Before I turn the stage to our keynote, I want to just take a few moments to highlight some of our, our few faculty innovators here, many faculty innovators in these areas. Their stories provide some powerful examples of why technology and collaboration matter so much in higher education. It's in the time I've been on campus, I've spent some time getting around, meeting some of these folks, learning more about the very significant innovations they bring uh, to, the, to the classroom in the area of information technology. Barbara Freeman, who is an assistant professor in the School of Medicine's anatomy department, utilized case Case's Media Vision courseware to develop an interactive digital libra learning library called Anatomy World to provide additional support beyond traditional lectures. Anatomy World is a topic-driven video repository of real cadaver demonstrations. We won't have any demos for you here <laughs> at lunch today. Uh, lectures and illustrations. According to the students, Anatomy World has become one of the most powerful learning tools in their course of study. So again, a great use of innovative technology to bring it to the classroom. Each fall, Elizabeth D'Amato, an associate professor in the School of Nursing, teaches an online neonatal physical assessment course to nurse practitioners and midwifery students. She has been using Adobe Connect, a web conferencing tool, to engage active communication student interaction and collaboration and real-time interactions with pre-recorded lectures and video demonstrations. Carlina per Pereira in the Department of Modern Languages and Literature has her Spanish students traveling virtually to Spain, Mexico, and Colombia. Instead of having students isolated in language labs, she holds classes in virtual field trips in Second Life, a 3D virtual world which you're familiar with, where her students travel to Spanish-speaking islands to talk with Spanish speakers about current topics like global economic crisis or Barack Obama's presidency. I think one of the priorities, if you're at all familiar with our strategic plan here at Case Western is the area is, in fact, internationalization. We're about ready to bring on board a new associate provost 
to oversee internationalization here on campus. And certainly, uh, you know, our goal is to provide uh, a much broader array of international experiences and opportunities and internships uh, for our students abroad. But obviously, this is a large place. We can't do that for everybody. So much of what we'll be doing over the next year are developing approaches to really bring the globe back to Case Western Reserve for our students. And of course, that's going to happen through information technology. You've heard about some of the programs in that that we're, that we're already doing to bring that, but there are many other opportunities in terms of teaming up our students, for example, in engineering through capstone design courses with, with students in, at IIT working on joint projects. And again, I don't have the ability to send our engineering students there or likewise vice versa, but we do have the opportunity through information technology to have them work together in an environment where they are essentially teaming up, and in many cases simulating what they'll be doing when they get out in the real world, where much of the real world world interactions between the engineers at GE in Cincinnati and Bangalore are virtual through uh, information technology. Now let me say a word about our keynote speaker, Larry Johnson. We're really pleased to have him here today. He's the CEO of New Media Consortium based in Austin, Texas. The New Media Consortium is a collection of more than 300 universities, colleges, and museums around the world focused on leading edge technologies and their impact on teaching and the learning environment. One of the marquee projects that Larry leads is the annual Horizon Report. This report is published by the New Media Consortium and Educause. For each of the past six years, the Horizon Report has distinguished itself as the industry standard for identifying emerging new technologies and helping us understand their relevance to teaching, learning, and creative expression missions to the university. Please join me in welcoming Larry Johnson. the mic on? Can you hear me? Great. Thank you, Bud, for that wonderful introduction. The NMC is very much about thinking about emerging technology. And so it might make sense for me to share my own personal definition of what we mean by that. And it's really quite simple. It's something that my dad taught me. Technology is anything that was invented after you're born. <clears throat> so that's why radio is not particularly much a technology for me, although for my dad, he built radios all of his life, winding the coils and all of that. I built computers, and uh, they were new technology for me. But I'm not really going to talk about technology today, but I'm going to talk about what we've learned after six years of thinking about how to apply emerging technologies to the work that we do. And we're calling them metatrends, mostly because megatrends was already taken. So, <laughs> so we couldn't really use that one. Um, the report itself, I'm going to uh, use Vuvox here, kind of go sideways. It's been growing for some time. Uh, we started in 2003, we're in the sixth year now, and kind of visually you can kind of see the reports have done fairly well, to the point now where we have about 100,000 uh, is our distribution, uh, and we are doing now actually quite a number of Horizon reports. So we, we have one that comes out each summer um, that's focused on Australia and New Zealand. We have Japanese editions. We have... Uh, a K-12 edition of the report. The report's published in a variety of foreign languages, including Spanish and German, Chinese, Japanese, and Catalan, which you'd understand if you hung out in Barcelona with us. Uh, and uh, the report itself is, is one that um, is meant to be a lens. There's so many emerging technologies. Every year, the advisory boards that we convene uh, often look at as many as 200 before they get down to the six that end up in the report um, that span all kinds of things. And that's quite a bit to consider. And so today what I'm going to try and do are two things. One is to help you to understand that, that the goal of the Horizon Project is to condense that into a much smaller set that we can actually literally consider. It's not a stock picker's list. It's really meant to be a list of things that if you pay attention to them, you will not waste your time, things that are important. And what we found over time is that, in fact, there are things that are only 
visible over time. And I like to use this image because it, it kind of illustrates that. I'm a photographer. And when I look at this image, I don't think about the water as much as I think about the time and revealing the aspect of water that you can only see when you are able to compress time in the way that this photograph does. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. We've uncovered seven metatrends, and I'm going to go through them in the context of this. The first one, this is not exactly a top 10 list, but it's kind of that way. The first one is computing in three dimensions. And there are so many applications of this that it has become pretty transparent. So I've got some examples that I want to show you in the images. The first one, um, this is actually a chair that was printed on a rapid prototyper. It folds up. And it's a piece of art. And art is actually one of the first places where we began to see three dimensions emerge via technology and computing. Um, and there are a number of artists that do it. But it wasn't long before we began to see applications in the sciences. And we were able to discover structures and aspects of our world that really were only visible when we could begin to see things in this way. And so these are proteins and um, visualized. And we can take that visualization now to, to great lengths so that we can even see how they fold and we can consider if they fold different ways and how they might combine to create antibiotics and drugs and such. We can even visualize down to the atomic level. And this is a photograph of iodine atoms that uh, was done at, MI, at uh, the Almaden Research Center, IBM's Almaden Research. In fact, Lev and I were there one day. And we moved atoms around. This is a picture of uh, one of the constructs that they had done that day. And we're seeing applications in every field. Now, this illustrates an application that, that I really like. Uh, Case Western does a lot with medicine. And one of the applications that's really interesting in 3D rendering, 3D visualization, is being able to take CAT scan or MRI data and turning that into um, actual physical models of parts of the body. So this illustrates a model of a pelvis. It's, it's actually a fairly common practice for an orthopedic surgeon to consider your knee before you know, a knee replacement and that sort of thing. Really kind of interesting. But we're also seeing more mundane sorts of ways of visualizing. This is a tool that was developed to help illustrate a very, very simple computing technique, just a sorting technique, something that a first year computer scientist uh, might learn, computer science student. Um, that simply shows you, in a matter of seconds, how the algorithm works. And it does it like that, because it engages a different part of the brain. We're also seeing some very interesting sorts of visualization. This one is done by the National Oceanographic and, Administrative and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, um, actually in Second Life. And it illustrates the weather patterns in the United States in real time uh, in a way that uh, is really quite compelling. But I'm going to come back to the arts as I end this particular topic, because that, that's where I think that the real expressions of this three-dimensionality are going to impact us. And this is a site that I really love that tries to illustrate Kafka. Um, and uh, <laughs> some of the nightmarish things that, that come out of that. But uh, I recommend it to you. Number six. Serious games. I debated what to call this one. Um, like, seriously, I mean, games. <laughs> Here's a quote from The Guardian up in Canada. We're fast approaching the point where an ordinary gamer is more likely to have had a child than to be one. I mean, we laugh at that, you know? And, and, and it was just this year when the Pew um, Internet project, which I respect so much. They, they did a study of youth to see you know, how many of them were gaming. And um, the results came back. And, and I thought, you know what? I'm in the wrong business. I really ought to be studying internet stuff, because I think I can do this. They came back, and they said, we found out that virtually every kid uh, has had gaming experience. Well, duh. <laughs> 
<laughs> How many of you know a kid? I mean, the, the, it's very much um, been a part of the way kids grow up in the same way that radio was a part of my growing up. I never even thought about it being something unique or special. Um, it's just something that they do. And so we're beginning to see games being used in all sorts of ways. And I was just out at USC, um, and I met the developer, actually, of America's Army. He has a very interesting proposition that, that he's trying to advance, and that is that if he could just get uh, enough money, he could fix science and math education in the world um, very easily and replace the need for any further teaching in science and math by developing games for them. And of course, that's, that's quite a statement. But he's got a lot of detail to back it up. And one of the things that he um, likes to point out is that companies like Electronic Arts and their competitors, they do this at a very high level. I mean, they're really smart. And they put a lot of resources behind something. And when they do that, they make it in incredibly engaging. And so he uses his benchmark, World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft cost $110 million to make. Well, that sounds really expensive when you're thinking about, gee, I'd like to have a game in my course. But if you're thinking about a matter of national policy, that you'd like to have a game that teaches an entire year of mathematics, $110 million is really not much at all. And then he puts together the numbers uh, of how many hours would it really take? Well, how many hours do kids spend on math now? Well, in a perfect world, they have 90 minutes of math every day, five days a week, you know, through the year. That adds up to 240 hours a year of math classes. The average World of Warcraft player devotes 240 hours to the game every six months. And so anyway, he extends it out. There's 12, 12 grade levels. And so you know, if you just give him $100 million for each one of those grade levels, he could develop the math courses for all 12 years for $1.2 billion. Now, isn't it interesting that when you say $1.2 billion, it actually sounds smaller than $100 million? <laughs> We just gave, you know, I don't know, a bunch of money to education. It, it's an interesting proposition. Games are serious, um, you know. And when they talk about enterprises having a game strategy, nobody, you know, twitters and chuckles anymore. I mean, it, it really is true that there are many things that can be taught. There, there are good reasons to do it. This is a model paper mill that Yale uses in their ecological uh, engineering classes because going into an actual paper plant is kind of dangerous. And the people that run it don't really want you there because you might get hurt and all those kinds of things. But yet they need to be able to understand what happens in there. They need to be able to measure the inputs and the outputs. And so having a model, in essence, a game that they could play, you know, let's build a better paper mill game, um, kind of makes a lot of sense. And there's some very interesting kinds of things that, that people are doing in some of these spaces. And um, so I'm going to play a little video from a faculty member on sabbatical that um, decided to use the virtual world of Second Life as a creative medium. So I'll just let this play for a minute. I heard a great Second Life story a few weeks ago. A couple broke up. I don't know all the details, but the next day, when the woman logged into her account and appeared in World, where she usually did, at the house she shared on the Sky platform with her partner, now ex, there was nothing. No house, no platform, no gardens, nothing. He had taken it all away. She was in free fall from 2,000 meters. I heard she was naked, but that might be hyperbole. It's a good image, though. How about that for living out a metaphor? I wonder how that must have felt to have literally have nothing where there used to be something. A house, a bed, a locus of relationship, a virtual place that accrued meaning over time and with experiences. Things happen fast in a virtual world and it is all fleeting. It could be derezzed in a second. 
as our fallen woman may or may not have had time to reflect on the way down. I wonder, did she fall all the way, crash dramatically and self-indulgently into the ground? Or stop midway to compose herself, figure out her next move? Did she teleport glibly away, off into the arms of a new lover? Who knows? The story has stuck with me, though, and as I filmed L1 falling again and again, as I fell again and again, I thought about the falling woman's experience, how second life makes metaphors manifest, and is not only that we choose them, but that sometimes in world we find ourselves right smack dab in the middle of an experience that resonates with symbolic and actual meaning so vibrantly and viscerally that it is living a poem. I hope that the falling woman dusted herself off and went on her merry way, that sometimes real feelings get hurt in here. And I hope that sometimes she has a good laugh at the falling story, because it is a great virtual cosmic joke. And it's a big metaverse full of poems to live, best done ludically, in the spirit of play. I'll let that stop there, but it's a nice example, I think, of, uh, of how these are being used. And, you know, looking at a different game, here's a quote uh, from a young man. He says, I'm a 33-year-old guy with a wife and a baby on the way. I just can't be going out all the time. And so in World of Warcraft, I've made like 50 new friends. So, so I'm reading this, and I'm listening to my wife responding to me if I were to say this. And she said, yeah, and you're still gone, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Number five. <laughs> Number five. Intuitive, seamless, interactive interfaces. This is one that I think is really going to be impactful. And so I've, I've highlighted a few technologies. This is Microsoft Surface here, um, which right now has a price point that's a little too high. But if you haven't actually experienced one, it's a very very compelling technology that's built around the idea of computing as a group experience, a fundamentally different way than we typically approach it. Um, I love this image of <laughs> this little boy and with Guitar Hero, but uh, what do you think? Has this kid got rock and roll potential? I mean, this is Cleveland, so you would be a good judge of this, but I, <laughs> I think he's got it. The, th the point is, though, is that you don't really need to have a user manual to use this device. You know, I mean, it just brings out the guitar hero in you. And then, of course, you know, the new, the new um, family of phones that have come out with, with multi-touch screens and, and really only one button. Again, a device that is so intuitive that you don't really need to know how to use it. You just begin to use it. The, and like the Wii, the, the iPhone also has an accelerometer in it, which is uh, a, a class of new sensors that are making all kinds of things possible. And the, the Wiimote um, is a very, very compelling way of interacting with the computer. How many of you have ever experienced a Wii? Okay, well, you guys are way ahead of Southern California, which uh, kind of surprised me that they weren't more into that there. But those of you who didn't raise your hands, this is worth exploring. It's way more fun than you might think. Um, and it's exercise, too. Yeah? And you can go bowling in the privacy of your home, which is kind of nice. Um, but there are other kinds of really interesting intuitive devices, and one is very much in the news around here today. There's Jeff yesterday making the announcement of the of the new uh, Kindle, you know, a device that you really don't need any instruction, you know, it just works, just works out of the box. Now there's fanciful kinds of things too. This is a, actually a computer built into a set of eyeglasses, which is pretty cool, except why would you want that? Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> And then this is a whole category of devices that are really huge in Japan, in Japan uh, and in, in other countries in the, in the Far East, increasingly here, every one of these devices has an RFID chip in it that enables it to communicate with other devices. And we're beginning to see whole new networks emerge, networks of objects that provide us information about the world that we live in. And um, in many ways, they're just for fun. Uh, kind of interesting approach to that. 
Number four. Number four is probably one of the most significant things that I think has happened with the internet since, since I've been involved with it, which is looking at my gray beard since it began. Um, the idea of the biggest websites, all of them, being based on the concept of user-generated content is something that we've just not, in education, begun to really conceptualize what that means. But it's not just the fact that the websites are, it's the fact that every one of us now is a walking, talking, multimedia capture device. Um, go to any of the larger news outlets like CNN or, or any of them actually, and they are actually soliciting. You know, if you're there, send us your cell phone video. You know, we want to put your video up on the news. The fact that every one of us potentially could be capturing you know, an important event is, it's staggering to think about what the implications of that are. So when we talk about user-generated content, I'm not just talking about YouTube and silly videos. I'm really talking about a society where all of us are gathering content routinely, every day, all the time. And so some of the implications of that um, are actually fairly visible. And so what I wanted to do was uh, show you something here. This is a, uh, a map of where we are, University Circle. Let me just click on it and launch the live um, Google map here. And let's uh, kind of zoom in. This is not quite as cool as Google Earth, but, but it's cool in its own way. So anyway, we come down here, and here we are right in the middle of University Circle. And the um, standard view of the map has you know, all the locations. And I can click on these, and it'll tell me the address and send me the website of things that are on campus you know, that have, have websites, all these little circles or websites. But where it really gets cool is when I begin to add things to it. And so let's add all the photographs that people have geotagged that might be here. There's actually quite a bit of content that we can go in and look at that just random people have added to, uh, to this map to illustrate it. And it becomes something to think about. I was actually mentioning to Lev earlier, you know, this is a new way to think about how to market your college that you, know, you could really influence what people are looking at here. Now, in, in this case, I think that you know, what, what you guys have representing your campus here is, is pretty good. <laughs> I do this pretty much everywhere I go to talk, and sometimes I really have to filter the content. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, your videos in particular, you can also add videos, you know, which is kind of a scary thing if you think about it. And, uh, and, <laughs> and so here, here's a fun one. This is um, Parade the Circle, you know, last, last summer. And uh, oh, oh, too bad. You're not going to get to see it. But, you know, I could show you instead, uh, you know, one of the uh, speeches from from uh, the mini series of talks here on campus. There's some of these that are on here. There's a commencement speaker down here. But let's add even more. Let's add more user-generated content here. We can add Wikipedia to the map. And so there's all the Wikipedia sites that, that, uh, that are part of this. In fact, we can scroll back and we can see that you know, they're really all over Cleveland. And even webcams. And I'm going to be very kind. I'm not going to show you any of the webcams because uh, uh, <laughs> You never know where that's going to take you. But um, it is really interesting to think about that user-generated content is now so pervasive that routinely, when people get ready to go on a trip, they will go to a Google map and look at all this content to kind of get a sense of where they, where they are. I'm going to show you one later from London. I mean, some of them are, are really well done. And another aspect of user-generated content is, is something that you hear a lot more about. And there are, there are going to be a, some sessions later that touch on this a little bit. Um, and this is kind of the dark side of user-generated content. Now, this particular image here is one that I really like because it was something that was put together by um, people in Second Life, actually. I got to go to, 
to testify to Congress on, on virtual worlds last year. And so they put together this little thing with my avatar called Mr. Pixel Goes to Washington. And it's a Frank Capra ripoff directly of the, of the poster, you know, which is really cute and I really like it, but it's like kind of totally illegal. And, um, <laughs> and, and so I want to show you a video. This video just won last week at Penn State a student mashup contest. And it is, um, well, I'll, I'll let you decide what it is. Um, but there's not one thing in it that actually comes with um, rights. We say they both are. Huh? About okay. suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating, or opening a window, or just walking dully along. How, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Now what I find so compelling about this, uh, first off, is that it's brought home the poem for me in a way that I've never experienced that poem before. It opened a door to the poem. And even though I'd heard the audio recording um, before, having the video from a Jay-Z video just illuminated in a way that would have never, ever occurred to me. And, and frankly, opened my eyes to the disturbing kind of nature of this poem. And so as I think about, yes, the recording by W.H. Auden, not really legal to use that in this context, um, because it's like up on YouTube. And, and then Jay-Z, I'm pretty sure Jay-Z has some ownership you know, feelings about his videos. Um, but at the same time, this is an art form that uh, we can't ignore. And so, you know, when I think about the pressures that are on the big publishing industries of our society, so music has been one that has been uh, lately largely fighting its battles in the courts, um, although there hasn't actually been any real serious prosecutions, been a lot of nasty letters. Motion picture industry is poised to do the same thing. Um, publishing, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very dynamic world out there around how this content can be mashed up. And when I think about where the pressure is coming from, I actually think that what we need to be recognizing is it's not the piracy that we need to be worried about if we're going to worry about things. Because what's really driving this is the art behind it. And we haven't really been thinking, we haven't been having a national conversation, certainly, about that aspect of it. This is a map of, um, of the ways that Creative Commons content, which is, of course, a solution to try and make this simpler and, and navigate the, the murky waters of uh, copyright a little easier. This is a map of how people are sharing creative resources. The fact is, is that in just about every creative field, the idea of mashup is, is very, very, very prominent. And it's not decoupage anymore. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a little different, something for us to think about. 
So that leads us to now number three, collective intelligence. And these are really kind of connected in, uh, in a way that I think, I, I hope will, I will reveal in a second. Um, I just want to point out this map here. This is a, a kind of a cool map. It is a map of the information distance between cities on the planet. Um, and so Hong Kong is much closer to New York than it appears you know, geographically because they, they do a lot of financial exchanges and great bandwidth between it. Um, but it illustrates something very compelling that's happening, which is the idea of our network beginning to have so much information in it that it's uh, being described as representing our collective intelligence. And there's, a, there's three ways that I've begun to think about it. One is tacit. And the first example of tacit is what we just looked at on the Google map. So that, you know, this is information that's embedded in the network. It simply needs to be exposed and we can find it. Um, there's other kinds of interesting stuff out here too. This is a tool called Retriever. And I did a little search with Retriever on the concept of blue circles. And this is what it came up with, you know, non-textual searching. So these are both textual kinds of things and, and non-textual. Um, and there's some very interesting things that you can do with this tacit information. Uh, this is a map that I did um, yesterday, actually, and I was thinking, okay, what could I, what could I show you about this? There's been some very interesting scholarship actually being done with the tremendous number of photographs in Flickr. Um, notably, migration patterns of birds are being analyzed based on the photographs of birds that are being taken, cockatoos in Australia, for example. Uh, there's been a study done on the doorbells of Florence, which I think that's really a suitably narrow <laughs> topic, that one. Um, I chose something a little broader. I was wondering where the butterflies were. Um, and, and I'm going to show it to you because it illustrates both the potential and the current limitations of what it is. And I, I won't go to Flickr Live because all the real information is here. But it found 5,000 photographs um, that matched the terms butterfly and Texas. So it found 5,000 butterfly pictures in Texas. And one thing that was really interesting to me, the orange or the pink dots show where the butterflies are. And on the surface, I, I, I thought, well, isn't that strange? There are no butterflies in West Texas, um, you know, according to these data, um, until I realized, well, there are no people in West Texas either. <laughs> so who was there to take the photographs of them? All the people are in the big cities, and so that's where the butterfly pictures are. So we're not quite there on the butterfly data yet. but. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Now, when we get to the explicit kinds of collective intelligence, this gets to be fairly interesting. This is a tool called Many Eyes, which accesses publicly available data sets uh, and mashes them up uh, any way that you like. And this particular visualization is US foreign aid over time, which I hadn't honestly spent a lot of time thinking about. But you can see that there's a big shift in the colors up in the top on the left-hand side, up on the top, you see kind of a uh, salmon color, you know, that represents actually a big volume, a big area, which represents a lot of money. And then there's kind of almost a, a schism. And then there's a big green area on the bottom to the right of that. Well, what happened was before 1973, most of the foreign aid of the United States, as it turns out, was going to Oman. That's the salmon color. So what was happening in Oman before 1973? You know, I would have never thought to even consider this. After 1973, the money began going to Israel. And that's the green. Until in 2003, the light green is Iraq. And it displaced a big portion of the money going to Israel. And so what we've revealed is some interesting aspects of our public policy there. I think that that's actually a, a tremendously deep and rich area for scholarship, is, is to do those kinds of searches. Wikipedia is the obvious explicit um, example of collective intelligence. There are tens of thousands of people that contribute to Wikipedia so that it has gotten to the point that the most up-to-date information on the H1N1 flu virus was actually in Wikipedia. 
almost in real time, you know, I mean, literally lagging uh, the need for news by less than an hour, which is just flat out remarkable. Now, we know that it takes some time for Wikipedia to, to establish its, its, uh, the credibility of a given topic, um, because it, it depends on several um, kind of almost random levels of review. But what's amazing is that it does get it right if you give it a little time, and, uh, and it's so responsive to it. There's a, another interesting kind of um, explicit collective information that is illustrated by this tool, which is called Community Walk. And this is another tool that allows you to map really anything um, to, to a location. This is uh, downtown London. And what they've done is, is they've uh, literally gathered together all the panoramic pictures of London and mapped out all the all the, uh, the sites there. They're attached to stories. They're attached to, to pictures. It's actually quite compelling. Uh, all built, hand-built, just like Wikipedia, but by lots and lots and lots of people. But where the interesting space is, and there are a couple sessions on this topic uh, to here today that I noticed that I, that I recommend you, that you go to, is the area of semantic kinds of collective intelligence. And we highlighted this in the Horizon Report this year, that what's new in this is that now there are applications that just kind of do this for you. Um, since Tim Berners-Lee wrote the original paper that kind of laid out what the semantic web could be, the big problem has been, how do we go back and make everything that already exists have this semantic information attached to it so that we can understand what it is? Um, well, there's a whole new category of software that's, that's making that happen. And this is a very, very simple one that I really like. Uh, it's called TripIt. And what TripIt does is a very simple thing, but it takes whatever the airline sends you, you know, when you buy a plane ticket, and it turns it into something really understandable. <laughs> In fact, I'll show you, um, you know, let me um, actually go to this trip. So, it put together this beautiful itinerary with maps, directions to my hotel. It tells me when to check out. It told me where to go to Sergio's. And basically, all I did was anytime I got an email related to this trip, I forwarded it. I didn't type a single character. Simply forwarded it to plans at tripit.com. It knows who I am. It knows where to put things. And it just builds this beautiful itinerary for me with everything I need in one place. Well, that's just such a useful thing. And what it does is it infers what things are from their placement in, in these uh, emails. It's, it's really compelling, and it gets it right most of the time. But then what's cool about it is it also then begins to build another level of, um, of data. And so we can go to my profile, and, and this is where it gets interesting. And, where I work, my colleagues, we all travel quite a bit, and so it, we're all in TripIt, and this allows us to have a little competitions between us. <laughs> I'm number one right now, I hope you notice that, in every category. Uh, sadly, what that means, though, is that already this year, I've traveled 36,000 miles to 20 cities in three countries, so I don't really remember what my house looks like, but. Uh, but I'm definitely a top in my network, so I like that part. Uh, it's uh, something that I, that I do recommend to you if you haven't tried. It's free, which is nice. Um, and so, whoop, whoop, stop, stop. Let me get this back on the full screen here. All right, so this takes us to number two. And I want to spend a little time on both two and, uh, and number one. They're, they're really closely related. Number two, the idea is that the network is everywhere. And for folks like us who can remember really just a couple of years ago when we were looking to get just wireless around, what we haven't noticed, at least what I hadn't noticed, is that around the world they never even bothered with wireless and have pretty much just made the jump, as Amazon has, straight to the cell networks. Um, now, the internet is, is a remarkable thing. These are internet maps, and, and I just love internet maps. Um, 
But where the really interesting things are happening is where the internet overlies with the cell networks. And so we can look at the internet as this cloud kind of thing, but this picture of this monk in Tibet talking on a telephone that actually accesses a network more powerful than anything we can access here in Cleveland is the one that gets to me. And so I began to think, all right, so let's think about you know, where all the people are. So if you want to know where all the people are, it's really handy to have a picture of the Earth at night because it kind of illustrates where they all are. You just kind of look at the lights. And so we can see you know, where the, the population areas are and so forth. So let's overlay this with a map of the cell phone networks. It's kind of at the same scale. The cell networks actually go more places than the electric grid. It has greater coverage. Let me, let me go back, okay? So here's the cell networks. Can I keep that picture in mind? Imagine this was a smooth dissolve. And now you see the Earth at night. It's way easier to build cellular networks, radio networks, satellite networks, than it is to build things that are connected by wires. And that's where all the activity is happening. And there's some interesting things on this map as well. You'll notice that Japan, for example, is all gold on this map. And so is Singapore and Korea and big parts of Europe, most of Europe, there's kind of little gold dust over North America. That's the 3G network. So I had a really, I had a bit of an epiphany a few weeks ago. My son is living in, in Korea right now, so my wife and I decided we'd go visit him. And, you know, and I thought, all right, well, I'll just call up AT&T and turn on my international plan and I'll just keep up with work and everything. And so I land in Tokyo and there's no signal on my spiffy iPhone. <laughs> and, uh, and I get to Korea and it's the same thing. And so I, you know, I, I, uh, I email AT&T customer service uh, from the hotel, you know, what's going on, what's going on? And they said, well, I'm really sorry, but your phone is not advanced enough for the networks that they have in those countries. Imagine how that made me feel, being, you know, like a tech guy. Uh, <laughs> You know, but the, the fact is, is that um, the cell networks are getting to be pretty compelling. And the reason why is what's driving competition in the cell networks. This is from 2007. Actually, if I had the image from uh, the most recent study, it's 1.2 billion mobile phones sold around the world every year. 1.2 billion. Now we were just talking about that. That's how much it would cost to like pay for science and math, grades one through 12. 1.2 billion mobile phones. That's one for every six people, a mobile phone. That's a lot of phones when you think about it. And the pace between the companies driving this to have ever, ever more capable phones is really something that is uh, profoundly new in these devices. And um, so in case you don't remember, uh, because you know it's easy to forget, how many cell phones have each of you had in your lives? You know, how many, like one or how about five? You know? Let's play this video here. The evolution of mobile phones it's going to be loud at first, but I'm going to, I'll turn it down. Okay. Okay, raise your hand when you, when you get to your first phone, okay? It'll start going faster. This one was around a long time. Okay, here they go. Okay, that was my first one. I had one of those as well, and you know I'm not going to really reveal how many I had. But when the Star Trek phone came out, I had to have one, <laughs> and that was you know a long time ago. That was like 12 years ago, and 12 years ago, more cars and more phones than cars and PCs combined. So.
All right, I had one of these as well. I really like this one. My wife kept hers for six years. It isn't like the phones wear out. Have you noticed that? I mean, they're still good. We just don't want them anymore. And here we are in 2003, there still isn't a color screen on any of these phones, you notice. And in fact, they're still kind of pixelated, not a whole lot of detail. Um, finally, we start to see color in 2004. So just between us and Europe, 230 million phones thrown away a year. I'm going to just go ahead and move on from that there. <laughs> yeah, there are some the futuristic phones and stuff, but, but let's, let's keep moving. When we talk about the network now, there, the, we can't ignore the cloud, though. The cell networks are very interesting, but, but cloud computing is something that really is going to be a game changer. And in fact, this presentation is in the cloud. And the software that I created it with, Vuvox, is also in the cloud. So, you know, I did this completely somewhere. I don't even know where it lives, and I don't even care because it's just there when I want it. Um, Google Apps works that way. More and more, we're seeing more and more kinds of applications that don't care what kind of computer you have. Really, everything you need is just part of it there, and they're often free, like this one is. Um, but there are, you know, research applications to it as well at North Carolina. Um, State University, they have developed what they call the virtual computer lab, where they have in the cloud a replica, actually a simulation of every computer that's ever been built, every operating system, every computer that's ever been built, so that they can test um, you know, new software across dozens and dozens of platforms at once, um, really kind of handy. And this brings us to the final, the final trend, number one. And the final trend is that not only is the network everywhere, but really the people are the network. And uh, this has been a sea change that has been so gentle in coming, I don't think that we've really even noticed it. But we used to organize the network around the ideas of files and folders. And increasingly, we don't. We organize it around people. Um, and I love this little map. This is actually a, a little, little old, but, but if you look up at the top, that says the icy north, Windows Live. <laughs> <laughs> and AOL is up there, too. And then, you know, what's interesting is down in the Siberia of this map is MySpace. Um, and as you move on down into the ocean of subculture, you know, and the sea of memes, there's Wikipedia is down there and, and, uh, and different kinds of things. What's, what's interesting about what's going on here is, is really how it's effective us socially. It used to be said, The Guardian again, a great source for tech, tech news, used to be said that spending too much time on your computer was an escape from reality. Well, nowadays, it's really the other way around. If youngsters don't spend enough time online, they're missing out on life as lived by their peers. Being online is absolutely an important part of who they are. Kind of, a, kind of hard for, for people of my generation to consider, but it actually really is true that people have, and I just watched you know, a movie on the plane over here. The movie is called He's Not Really That Into You. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, really, really cute. So uh, really, and, and a statement on um, the role of Facebook and MySpace in online dating. But uh, you know, here's another picture of, of monks gathering around you know, a cell phone and you know, text or picture from, from a colleague. Um, and we've begun to see science kind of emerging around this idea. And I love this social graph. I refer to this one as the old broccoli graph. 
um, you know, but it's mapping uh, a person's social network. And I like to think of a social network uh, technologically as having its birth back in the days of the phone system, when you would literally dial up and say, you know, could you connect me to Wendy, please? And they'd say, oh, sure, you know, and, uh, and they would. Well, today, you know, our social network, the, the, the one everybody thinks about is, is Facebook. And um, while we're here, I noticed that, that what's the registration, Lev? 310, OK. I have 658 Facebook friends. If every one of you friended me today, I would almost be to 1,000, which is my goal. <laughs> <laughs> So just to put it out there, just to put it out there. Thank you very much. Social networks, though, are pervasive. They're everywhere. This is one that my son introduced me to when he was traveling uh, the United States last year. And his goal was to go to all 50 states. And he only had $2,000. And he did it. And how did he do it? He slept on couches everywhere he went. And there is a trust-based network called the Couch Surfing Network. It's just remarkable how they help people vet each other. Uh, it's, it's, it's very safety focused. Uh, they have a lot of fun, though. And uh, it's all over the world. There's 1.2 million people that are part of the Couch Surfing Network. And they just all love to travel for free. And you know, kind of a, kind of a cool idea. And you know, so uh, you know, as we look at the networks um, and the science is coming up, I thought, well, let me let me illustrate to you, you know, just kind of briefly, a couple of, of social graphs is what they're calling them. This one is my social graph, and it is um, my Facebook friends, the 658, soon to be a thousand, and. Um, <laughs> You know, as I as I go around, it shows me the interconnections of where they are, and it's and it's remarkable how I can learn things about my own interrelationships. Um, you know, from from this kind of data like this, you can see really three circles of data. Two are really well defined, and then there's a third one that that is uh, kind of buried in the middle of the center one. But the the center circle is. Uh, people that I know through my work in, in virtual worlds. And they lead to really every country on the planet um, because of that. The outside circle is my NMC connections. Um, and then you know I have kind of some random ones out here that are a little different. And then if I were to scroll up, and it's really off the screen up in the right, those are my family connections. But kind of interesting how that, how that uh, maps out. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we um, carried that research further to somebody who really, really has an extensive social network? And I, so I was thinking, well, who, who could that be? Hmm. Let me get to the, to the slides here. This one's really slow to get by. Come on. And, uh, and so we began to do a little research around this guy. <laughs> He has so many connections on LinkedIn that he's maxed it out. You know, I went to check last night just to see. I was figuring, you know, 3,728 or whatever it might be, 5,000 plus. That's as many as you can get in uh, in LinkedIn. And so I was asking Lab, um, you know, how how do you how do you have a, a network like this? And I, I'll admit I had my own kind of hypothesis about how he did it. <laughs> But he said, no, you know, it's just really that he keeps a lot of business cards. And, and so you know, we've got uh, a network for, for Lev here. And um, so we began to really research that. And um, you know, it, it was just the, the data were perplexing. And so we called in all kinds of sophisticated kinds of, of software you know, to really try and get into how he puts together his social network. Um, and here's the funny thing. This same number kept coming up <laughs> all the time. 1,959. We couldn't understand it. We couldn't understand it at all. And um, so finally, we reached out into the network to somebody that we thought was really smart. 
I really admire this guy because he promotes our, our publication. And, you know, and he says, well, duh, it's not 1,959, it's a year. It's Lev's birthday. And he says, <laughs> and he says, if you'll get everybody in the room to light a birthday candle, we might be able to approximate how old Lev is. <laughs> Luckily, he was uh, born in May, so we can get a fairly accurate thing. And if we can do that, and on every table, there's a little baggie there with a candle and a match, if you could get it lit up. Barack Obama said he would, he would help us sing happy birthday. All right, so we light those candles. Come on, let's, let's get them lit up here. Okay, we're looking good over here, nice and bright. It's feeling kind of like a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in here. <laughs> All right, so we're getting close, we're getting close. All right, here he comes. Here he comes, here comes the president. Be ready to sing along now, because it's going to go quick. Yep. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lev. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, it'll be the last time I get invited to case, I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> And so with that, I think I will move on to the sunset of my talk. Happy birthday, Lev. <laughs> Learn more about the Horizon Project at uh, some URL that is at the end of this. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much, and have a good rest of your conference. <laughs>